On this Thursday night, political upheaval in Alberta. Premier Jason Kenney forced out of the party he united. The healing process for our party can begin only when he's gone. His party now divided, plus the implications federally. No access. Huawei technology blocked from Canada's 5G network. Secret training, exclusive access to the Canadian combat veterans training Ukrainian civilians to take on Russian forces. We can do a lot more by training the guys here than just going to the front. Suspected cases of monkeypox in Canada. What we know and don't know about the virus. And the royals fly north. Reconciliation and climate change take center stage on their tour. Global National with Donna Friesen. Good evening and thanks for joining us. After a three-year-long review, the federal government has finally made a decision on Huawei. It has banned the Chinese telecom giant from installing its technology in Canada's 5G network, along with the state-owned ZTE technology, another Chinese company. Their technology is also banned from the existing 4G network, and anything installed must be removed. It brings Canada in line with allies like the United States. Let me be very clear. We will always protect the safety and security of Canadians and will take any actions necessary to safeguard our telecommunication infrastructure. Our Ottawa Bureau Chief Mercedes Stevenson is with me. Mercedes, not a huge surprise, but it sure has taken a long time to get here. It's taken years, Donna, and the government wouldn't say if there was any new national security revelations that had set this apart. But behind the scenes, what people say is this was all about waiting for the two Michaels to be released from China. There was deep concern about their well-being and putting a ban on Huawei while they were still in a Chinese prison. That, of course, is resolved now. And so the feeling is that the government is ready to move forward. The reality is many telecoms in Canada have developed 5G technology without this, assuming it was essentially de facto banned by not acting. There was concerns that the Chinese government could use national security laws to hack into Canadian systems through that. And as well, the Canadian government didn't want to be seen uh, to be approving of Huawei after their direct involvement in what happened between Meng Wanzhou and the two Michaels. There's questions now about what retaliation might look like, including for Canadians who are in China or potential cyber attacks here in Canada. As for telecoms who have chosen to install the technology despite the risk, the Canadian government says that they are not going to be reimbursing them in any way financially for their decisions. And this may be the change of direction for the Trudeau government that Prime Minister Trudeau first indicated in his interview with us at Christmas, Donna, saying that democracies need to band together and stop being played off against each other on economics by China. All right, Mercedes Stevenson in Ottawa, thanks. Now to the political upheaval in Alberta. Last night, Premier Jason Kenney said he was quitting as leader of the United Conservative Party. Today, after a six-hour caucus meeting, he said not quite yet. Kenney's leadership, challenged from within his own caucus, collapsed last night. 51.4% of party members voted to keep him. And Kenney said Wednesday that that is not adequate support to continue as leader. Then there's today. Tom Vernon is outside the building in Calgary where that caucus meeting just wrapped up. Tom, turns out Kenny's not leaving until the party finds a new leader, yet almost half the membership just voted to get rid of him. So do you know what happened in that caucus meeting? <laughs> It was a long one. I mean, it was originally scheduled to last two hours. It went more than six hours. And we got a statement just a short time ago that after much debate inside, a vigorous discussion and debate about the future of the party, that they have decided that they must remain united and focus on the best interests of Albertans and be committed to doing the job that Albertans elected us to do. And in doing so, Jason Kenney will remain premier until a new leader is elected. Now, this would have been a vigorous debate coming into the meeting this morning. We spoke with Brian Jean, who came back to politics specifically to remove Jason Kenney as leader, and he's made it no bones about it that Jason Kenney must step down and there must be an interim leader for this party to begin to move forward, for the divisions inside the party to begin to heal. We heard other MLAs say the same sort of thing, but apparently the Premier had enough votes in caucus to remain in place. What we don't know is when the leadership election will be launched and when that new leader will be elected. So we don't have a timeline at this point. Do, do we know mm -hmm. if Kenny has ruled himself out of running for the leadership a second time? Could he conceivably do that? I, 
it, it'd be tough to, to believe, but I mean, the, the Constitution, the party Constitution says an interim leader cannot run for the leadership of the United Conservative Party. Now, I guess technically, Premier Jason Kenney is not the interim leader. He remains the leader of the party. Now, he did tweet out the letter that he sent to the party saying that he will remain on until a new leader is elected and he will resign once that new leader has been selected. So I don't know if he would resign to be named the leader again if he ran in this again, but we have not gotten a clear answer from him yet. Interesting times, Donna. Interesting times, stranger things. All right, uh, <laughs> Tom Vernon in Calgary tonight, thank you. The biggest turmoil is inside Alberta, but the turmoil of Jason Kenney and the fracture in the Conservative Party have implications on the federal scene as well. Our chief political correspondent, David Aiken, is with me from Ottawa. David. Well, you know, Donna, the ability to push out a leader, even a sitting premier, that's a feature, not a bug, for many conservatives across the country. It's part of the grassroots heritage, stretching back to the Reform Party's ideas of giving citizens recall power. A leader that falls out of favor with the base had best watch their backs. And that is Jason Kenney. That was Aaron O'Toole. That was Andrew Scheer. And this is a trend that did not escape the notice of Randy Boissonneau. He's a liberal, and he's the only member of Justin Trudeau's cabinet from Alberta. I'm sensing a disturbing trend in, in conservative politics in, in Canada and across the country. Mr. Kenney was pushed out of his party because he wasn't extreme enough. Now, some conservatives will object to being called extreme, but conservative insiders tell me the lesson for leaders of conservative parties everywhere is clear. You lose your job if you lose the base. But there's a danger for a leader that focuses so much on the base, they forget about the broader electorate, the voters you need to win to win an election. Indeed, this is the defining question of the federal leadership contest. Win the base or expand the base? Pierre Poilievre or Jean Charest? Expect Kenny's resignation to become an issue in the federal leadership contest, Donna. All right, David Aiken, thank you. Now to Russia's war in Ukraine. U.S. President Joe Biden says Finland and Sweden have the full, total, complete backing from his country to join NATO. Finland and Sweden make NATO stronger. Not just because of their capacity, but their strong, strong democracies. And a strong, united NATO is the foundation of America's security. The leaders of Finland and Sweden joined Biden at the White House. The once neutral Nordic nations have formally applied to join NATO in response to Russia's invasion of Ukraine. They're facing a challenge from Turkey, but the White House expects that issue to be resolved. Over the past couple of months, photos have begun appearing on social media from Ukraine showing destroyed Russian military vehicles spray painted with the word Wolverines. The peculiar calling card has sparked international intrigue over who is responsible for destroying and tagging the Russian tanks. Thanks. Jeff Semple reports from Ukraine where he got exclusive access to a secretive group of foreign volunteers. At a secret location in western Ukraine, these Ukrainian civilians are receiving a specialized training course. They're learning to fight like wolverines. This is something new and special. I've never been part of anything like this before. Last month, after Russian forces suffered a crushing defeat near Ukraine's capital, residents surveying the damage came across a peculiar sight. Abandoned Russian military vehicles, spray-painted with the word Wolverines. The photos, shared on social media, sparked international intrigue over who was responsible. Well now, the secretive group is stepping out of the shadows for the first time granting Global News exclusive access inside their operation. We're going in loud and we're going in fast. The Wolverines are led by around 100 volunteers from 20 countries, American, British and Canadian combat veterans and former special forces, here to fight the Russians and train the Ukrainians. Because a lot of these guys don't have any training, this Wolverine's instructor is from BC. The more people we can train, that's more people who can help defend the country. So we can do a lot more by training the guys here than just going to the front. Over three months, they provided this week-long crash course to more than 6,000 Ukrainians, from soldiers to civilians. 
I learned a lot, literally a lot from the guys. This Ukrainian, one of the first to be trained, had no combat experience. Now he's training others. How it was three months ago, how I am now, it's a completely different level. Besides learning how to clear an abandoned building, perform rescues and operate an AK-47, the Wolverines are also learning the power of a symbol. The Wolverine's shoulder patch is inspired by a Cold War classic. Wolverines! The fictional 1984 film Red Dawn about a group of American teens who fight off a Soviet invasion of the United States. All while using their high school mascot's name as a calling card. Before completing their training, the Ukrainians are required to watch the movie for inspiration. And the guys absolutely love it. It's a clear presentation of how young, motivated people, not professional soldiers, can step up, step up to the plate and knock it out of the park. The Wolverines and their Ukrainian students then head together to the front lines, armed with guns and cans of spray paint to leave their mark. It's uh, something to inspire people. People see it, they know we're here, they know that they're not alone. And it seems that message is getting through. A Ukrainian pop star just released this music video dedicated to the Wolverines. Meanwhile, in central Ukraine, they took down this Soviet statue and replaced it with a Wolverines tagged tank. This was like a beacon of hope for our guys. It really was, that the people are getting it. They see it, they're out there, they love it. But also this has an impact on the psychology of the Russians, you know, to know that the world has united against them. We're here. And he says they're here to stay until the war is won. <laughs> Jeff Semple, Global News in Western Ukraine. Suspected cases of a rare virus in Canada coming up. It could be monkeypox, why public health officials say not to panic. In Ontario, two of the four leaders of the province's major political parties are sidelined with COVID-19 two weeks before Election Day. Ontario NDP leader Andrea Horvath and Green Party leader Mike Schreiner have both tested positive. Both are not seriously ill. They're isolating but feeling well and plan to continue campaigning remotely. PC leader Doug Ford and Stephen Del Duca of the Ontario Liberals tested negative. All four shared a small stage on Monday for a televised debate. The election is June 2nd. Well, you've no doubt heard about monkeypox by now. More countries around the world are reporting potential cases of the rare virus, including Canada. Cases are usually confined to Africa, and researchers are trying to figure out how widespread the virus is. Jamie Marocker explains what monkeypox is and how it might have traveled here. Dr. Safa Barkati has made a career of studying rare tropical diseases, and until recently, she had never even seen a suspected case of monkeypox. There was a feeling of, oh my God, like, are, are we really seeing a case? And you know, there's, a, a, yeah, we're a, a little bit shocked. But at the This week, there have been 17 possible cases of the contagious virus reported to public health officials in and around Montreal. Uh, so far, we have a few links of travel. Uh, we have uh, this case, particularly in the, in the United States. One American man recovering in hospital recently traveled to Canada. The virus has also shown up in clusters in the UK, Portugal, Sweden, Italy, and is being investigated in Spain. Unusual, as it is rare to see the illness outside of Africa. Is this a new variant of this virus that um, is more transmissible human to human? Or is it that this virus emerged into conditions that were just right to allow it to, to spread. Monkeypox spreads through close contacts or even aerosols and mm -hmm. is a cousin of smallpox, mm -hmm. something most Canadians over 50 would be vaccinated for. Symptoms can include fever, headache, fatigue, and swollen lymph nodes, as well as facial rashes and lesions. We should definitely see an increase of the number of cases throughout the coming, the coming days, that's for sure. Shifting the priority to containment and contact tracing. Jamie Marocker, Global News, Toronto. Ahead, how easy is it to smuggle illegal handguns into Canada?
Cross-border gun smuggling has long played a role in the rise in gun violence in Canada. Last night we told you how a single illegal handgun from the U.S. is linked to the unrelated murders of two Ontario teenagers. How did that gun get here? Well, in part two of our global news investigation, Tracy Tong looks at how easy it is. If you're in for a long gun, you have to be 18 years of age, you have to be a resident of Michigan, you have to be a citizen of the United States. What about handguns? Handguns, you need to be 21. And we're going to execute some paperwork to make sure that your gun gets registered with the state of Michigan. The paperwork involved in buying a handgun in Michigan involves a form which asks if you're an American citizen, if you're the actual buyer of the firearm, if you're a convicted felon, and if you're not flagged in the FBI's instant background check system, the gun is yours. How easy is it to lie on that form? Very easy. I have no, I have no way of knowing if you're being truthful or not. People are really good at duplicating identification now, fraudulently. American authorities call it lying and buying. And it can be even easier at gun shows. The rules are more relaxed for private sellers who aren't officially making a business out of buying and selling guns. I suppose if it's citizen to citizen, there's no background check being conducted. Now, if I happen to know you're a felon, then it's illegal for me to transfer you a gun. But how would you know that? I would, you'd have to tell me. Straw purchasing is when someone buys a handgun for someone else, who is usually ineligible to purchase it. Do I think they understand what they're doing is wrong? Yes, I do. Do I think they understand the carnage that they're going to cause? I don't, but I think, unfortunately, in the end, the money talks. This is 580. Yeah. What sells for a few hundred bucks in the United States multiplies in value on the Canadian black market. On the streets in Toronto, these would go for about five to $7,000. I believe that. That's because you can't get them. It's a lucrative business. Last year, the Canadian Border Services Agency seized more than 1,100 firearms, and that is just a fraction of the flow. Even recently in November, 56 firearms in a bag in a trunk of a car and cross a border. 663 crime guns were recovered in the city of Toronto in 2020. About 85%, police say, are traced back to the United States. I brought uh, samples of the top 10 crime guns that are seized in the province of Ontario. The Taurus PT740 Slim is the same kind of gun used to kill Ontario teenagers Jeremy Cook and Lee St. Ross in 2015. Why would somebody opt for this one? Well, it's cool, it's easy to use, it's easy to load, and inexpensive. The ultimate price paid in lives lost. Tracy Tong, Global News. And that price keeps going up. In part three, Tracy looks at who's bringing these weapons into Canada and whether they'll face justice. That's tomorrow on Global National. And you can read more about the story online on our website, globalnews.ca slash globalnational. Royalty goes north next. What was on the agenda as the future king met members of the indigenous community? Prince Charles and his wife Camilla have landed in the Northwest Territories. Received a warm welcome at the Yellow Knives Dene First Nation community of Deta. Reconciliation and climate change are taking center stage during this last day of the royal visit to mark the Queen's Platinum Jubilee. Our Heather Urex West is there tonight where the royals have been meeting with Indigenous leaders. Donna, reconciliation has been a major focus of the Royals' three-day whirlwind Canadian tour, culminating with plenty of opportunity here in the Northwest Territories for the couple to listen and learn. In our language, we call it Tuneze. Joe Bailey loves to share his community and his culture with visitors. He operates a tour company offering northern adventures with opportunities to better understand the Indigenous experience here. Uh, we do a tour down Fort Province. They have the first residential school memorial there. And I bring guests there and I talk about residential and what happened. I cry every time at the memorial. As an intergenerational residential school survivor, Bailey says it's important for the royal family to at least acknowledge the trauma of the past. Who do we want to be? A country on a path of reconciliation a country that listens. Your Royal Highnesses, we welcome you on this path with us. 
At a reception at Rideau Hall Wednesday night, Canada's first Indigenous Governor General urged the royal couple to keep learning, while other Indigenous leaders, including Assembly of First Nations Chief Roseanne Archibald, expressed the need for an apology from the Crown for the pain caused by residential schools. In the spirit of reconciliation, community members joined the prince and his wife Thursday in the Dene First Nation community of Deda for the sacred feeding the fire ceremony, a traditional way to seek guidance and offer thanks. We're so honored for him to be here and be part of it, the feeding the fire today. It's pretty great that we are the ones they chose to come to and they, the ones they chose to talk to. Climate change and its impact on Canada's north was also a focus of the royal visit. The Deda Ice Road, a critical link between communities through the winter, has lately been open to the public for only 90 days because of ice integrity, compared to more than 140 days decades ago. After the royals depart, the community will have something to remember the royal visit by. The Platinum Jubilee Garden in Yellowknife will feature many sacred indigenous plants, sage and sweetgrass, as well as orange flowers to remember the legacy of residential schools. Heather Urex West, Global News, in Deda, Northwest Territories. And that is Global National for this Thursday. I'm Donna Friesen.